Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. A wise person, no matter his or her beliefs, understands that human motivations and desires are naturally selfish. We humans think and act from the shallow perspective of personal experience on behalf of our biological imperative, self-preservation. Our view of others, our understanding of the gods we create, and most importantly, our actions in the world are corrupt because our core motivation, me, myself, and I, is corrupt. Self-preservation and self-interest are coded in our DNA. How can anyone mitigate an elemental biological impulse? You can't. There is no ideology, philosophy, or belief system that can change human biology. So how is the Bible different? It assumes the worst. It supposes that all human beings are stubborn, and that all human beings will always refuse to change. Its hope is not in humanity, but in the possibility that despite ourselves, a few people with ears to hear might be willing to follow a commandment that goes against our nature. In the Gospel of Mark, such a commandment is preached as widely as possible for our sake and for the sake of the common good. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verses 14 to 23. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 166 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We have all heard it. It's the same old plot that is presented to us time and time again by our favorite production company, Disney. Are you feeling down and out? Is the world against you? Just follow your heart and everything will work out fine. In comes the Jesus portion of the plot. It'll be fine in worldly terms because you'll be self-satisfied and do whatever you want for your benefit at the expense of everyone, including and especially your enemies. This false teaching that it's good for a human being to follow their heart is a destructive teaching. And we can see the fruit of this teaching at work in relationships and in communities in our country because people live not for each other and for the common good, they live for themselves. They do what feels good, but they don't do what is necessary. They don't do their duty. Their own heart becomes the reference as opposed to their neighbor as the reference, as opposed to God and his teaching as the reference, who's telling us to do something that goes against our heart, or our neighbor who forces us to do something that goes against our heart, or our spouse. I have a friend who's having marital problems, and one of the marital problems is that he's sick and tired of his wife telling him what to do. And I remind him, let her tell you what to do. It's not going to be so bad. If you do those things that your wife tells you to do, you've never once told me of something that she told you to do that was immoral or incorrect. They're just stuff that you don't want to do. You just don't feel like doing it. If you just do it, there'd be a lot less to fight about. You are responsible to do whatever your spouse wants you to do, unless what they ask you to do is to oppose the gospel. For example, if your wife says, don't love your neighbor, then you have something to fight about. But anything else she wants, if it doesn't stop you from loving your neighbor, your only correct response scripturally is yes, dear. 
I know that's difficult because you want to follow your heart the way you were trained, not only by Disney, but by all the commercials you watched growing up in between your favorite TV shows. They all want you to follow your heart. Go to the cereal aisle at the grocery store. And spend money. Follow your heart. Get the cereal that really makes you feel complete and whole inside. Take me away. I mean, we could go on and on explaining to you why this prevailing human wisdom that if you're having difficulty or you want to find out what you should do with your life or whatever, you need to look inside yourself. That's not what Jesus taught us. That's not what the Gospel of Mark is teaching. What the Gospel of Mark is teaching us is that you have to look to wisdom to govern your heart. If you trust your heart, if you look inside yourself, you will end up falling prey to the sin of idolatry. This is the showdown between the biblical tradition and prevailing human wisdom. You do not look to yourself. You do not trust yourself. Paul teaches us that we are nothing and that only a fool thinks that he is something when he is passing away. So we look to that which does not pass away, which is the Lord's word in Isaiah, which Mark is preaching. You're just a branch coming off of the vine you hopefully will produce fruit. Within that fruit will be the seed for the next generation. That's your only job. Make sure that the fruits keep coming. The fruits keep coming. The fruits keep coming. That your actions reflect that teaching that you received. And that's what we've been seeing in Mark. All that Jesus is about is making sure that that seed is spread. Conservatives and liberals have ripped the wisdom of the gospel in half. Because the conservatives say correctly that the human heart is wicked. But then, because of that wickedness, they justify to themselves practical actions meant to protect their interests. The liberals say, no, we should love everybody and not worry about practical implications. However, they say so on the basis of a false teaching. They say so because they believe that the human being is essentially good. But this is not true. And this is why both ideologies fail. You have to uphold what conservative ideology understands, that human beings commit wickedness. And then you have to take what the liberals have stripped from wisdom, which is that you have to do whatever you can to help people no matter what. And if you put them together, you have people saying, we are going to love people at our expense, not because they are good or because they deserve it, but because it is correct. That is what we are being taught here. I read recently about the attacks on New Year's Eve in cities in Germany. On the one hand, the conservatives say, the immigrants, they're nasty, they're evil people, they're causing problems. And on the other hand, the liberals say, no, they just don't understand our culture. They don't understand that a woman in a miniskirt isn't asking for advances. And this writer that I was reading, Slavoj Žižek, says, no, they understand very well that this is the norm and the mores of the country they're in. But they, being a suffering lower class, are trying to stick it to the man. And they're trying to hit them exactly where it hurts. And so these immigrants whom we are bound to love and bound to welcome are perfectly capable of performing evil acts, purposely aiming at upsetting the comfort of the middle class of the country that they're in. Because no one is good but God alone. Liberals and conservatives both want to look for a victor and a bad guy. And scripture is saying there are no victors, there are no good guys. No one is good but God alone. So only scripture will shame the rich for their treatment of the poor while also shaming the poor. And it bears repeating that any sermon that tries to discern who the good guys are and the bad guys are in the community, inside or out, is anti-scriptural. The only biblical sermon is the one that accepts the presupposition of Jesus that everyone is condemned for their sake so that they wouldn't become self-righteous. It's not rocket science, Richard, but no one wants to accept it because we would rather believe there's a good side and a bad side. But as we'll hear from Jesus, no good can come out of the human heart. 
after he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. It's about the teaching. Previously, he was just teaching about pure hands and impure hands, and now he's again trying to get the people to understand. Listen to me. He never says, come and let me heal you, but he says, listen to me and understand. This is the central role that Jesus is playing. That's why in the liturgies of the Eastern churches, before the reading is announced to the assembly, the deacon stands up and says, listen, let us attend, pay attention. Wisdom is going to be announced in the assembly. Open your ears. This is that function. It's the announcement that it's time to be quiet, to stand still, and hear. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him, but the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. And again, I want to stress what we said at the beginning of this episode. The presupposition of Scripture is that the human being can only function the way he is intended to function when he submits to God's law, to God's instruction, his wisdom, which is external. This is an anti-existentialist teaching. Jesus is very radical. There is nothing outside the man which can defile him. This comes right on the heels of the scribes and the Pharisees worried about, oh, if they wash their hands like this, is it okay? If they don't wash their hands, is it okay? Jesus takes it to the next level. There is nothing that can defile the human being. You're worried about the Greek touching you or the Roman touching you. You're worried about being around someone who has a hemorrhage. You're worried about all this stuff. You're worried about how others can pollute you when the real threat is on the inside. It's on the inside of the community. It's on the inside of you, the individual. We are the source of our own destruction and our only hope is to listen and understand if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And again, this calls to mind the mark and admonition about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately this blasphemy, as it is applied in Mark, is the sin of hearing with blinders on and not understanding something obvious. That's the warning in the prophetic texts that you hear and don't understand and see and still are blind because you refuse to open your heart to the simple truth that you are the problem. If you can't hear, it's your problem. Again, it's not something from the outside that corrupted you, making you incapable of hearing or understanding. It is you. This is the personal accountability gospel. And the other thing that's beautiful about this expression, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear, not only does it condemn those who do not submit to the simplicity of biblical metaphor and its obvious meaning, it's also making a statement that the bus keeps moving. Jesus is not going to wait for people who don't get it and hold their hand because that would be supremely irresponsible on his part. He has to make sure he spreads the word as loudly and to as many people as possible so that those who are willing to accept the obvious meaning of scripture, that we are sinners and we are unrighteous and as Basil the Great said, we have done nothing good upon the earth. Only God is good. If we can get that message out for those who do have ears to hear, there is hope, not just for them, but for what that seed, that teaching will produce in them once again, borrowing from Pauline terminology, for the sake of the common good. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. So look, Richard, Jesus just said, for anyone who has ears to hear, for anyone who understands and is familiar with Torah, you're going to understand the simple, obvious meaning because you put the effort in to understand. And who are the first people who don't get it? It's the disciples. Listen to me, all of you understand. Then he gives his teaching, and then he says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus really bookends this. He really tries to emphasize this as his central teaching. And the disciples say, 
okay, what what what, what is that? I don't understand what you're what, talking what, about. Jesus, you, I don't I don't I don't get it. Are, are you saying that we're bad? Is that no? But we're not bad. We're we're basically good. Isn't everyone basically good? Why do people talk this way? Why do they struggle with it? Because if what Jesus is saying is true and you accept it, you're the bad guy. And you don't want to believe you're the bad guys because you're the heads of the 12 tribes. You're Jesus' inner circle. How could you be a bad guy? You gave up everything so you could follow him, right? And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? So this is interesting because he simply repeats the teaching one more time. Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? How many ways can Jesus say the same thing so that they understand? He berates them. Are you so lacking in understanding also? He's actually comparing them to the scribes and the Pharisees who are all preoccupied about the washing of hands and the disciples think, well, you know, we're not as stupid as those scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus says, you understand as little as they do. But Jesus, does that mean that if we touch a leper... It's okay, but I don't want to touch a leper because I might get leprosy. Well, didn't you read Leviticus? You have to keep touching the leper for his sake. You have to do everything in your power to make sure you don't put someone out of the community because they're a leper. Even if it means the priest gets sick. Because in the end, it's not about whether or not you catch leprosy because you're going to die anyways. It's about whether or not you showed mercy on the leper and the outcast. They want to say that the outcasts are the source of uncleanness. And that is what Jesus is attacking here. The only source of uncleanness is you because you are wicked and unfaithful and disobedient. Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus, he declared all foods clean. In other words, Jesus is talking about basic science. You're looking at a piece of food while others are starving and trying to debate whether it's clean or not. But come on, guys, you eat it, your body processes the food, and then it goes out in the latrine. So what's the issue? Wake up. Do you really think that all of this wisdom was handed down from the Lord on Mount Sinai so that you would control what you eat and be afraid of who you touch? What's the purpose of this wisdom? Especially when we read this during Lent, where there's so much preoccupation about food and what kind of food. And it's interesting how unspiritual Jesus is when he talks about food. It's completely biological. Right. You eat it, you take the nutrients from it, and it goes on to the latrine, like you said, Father. And that's it. That's the beginning and end of what Jesus has to say about food. So with all respect to Hume, there is no bloody leap of faith. Jesus is saying that one plus one equals two, and the Christians are saying, so you mean it means three? There's no leap of faith. There's a decision to trust or not trust, the way a Kung Fu student makes a decision to trust the master of his dojo. You are either going to commit to this or not. But when you commit, you don't suspend logic. You're being asked to accept something that's completely reasonable and logical if you accept the presupposition of Scripture, which is the love of neighbor, which is thoroughly rational, but it goes against your rationale because you are interested in your own preservation, whether it's the individual or the clan. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man that is what defiles the man, and he is referring to the word and the deed. What men say when they are empty words, they fall to the ground. They have no substance. There's no real debar. There's no weight on the one hand. On the other hand, it's what they do. It's the outcome of the false teaching. You are judged not by what you eat, not by whom you touch. You're judged by how you treat people. When the disciples are looking for an interpretation, he won't interpret it. He simply repeats it. Before he said, the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. And here he says, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. He simply repeats his own words. Before we saw Jesus interpret his parables. Here he is not speaking in parables. He is saying, I'm just speaking straight forward with you. And interestingly, the disciples understand just as clearly straightforward words as they understood 
parables, which is not very well. It is not how Jesus speaks that confuses them. It is what Jesus is teaching and their stuffed ears that are incapable of hearing. Jesus proves his point that they are simply stubborn because whether it's with a parable or without a parable, whether it's straightforward or it's confusing, the disciples will not understand. And this is the sin against the Holy Spirit. It is the refusal to understand because you don't want to understand. If it benefits you that the answer is three, your teacher will explain that one plus one equals two and they can do it till they're blue in the face, you will still hear three because it suits you. It is a choice to be blind and God can heal every infirmity except your choice to be blind. He can't make you listen. You have to decide to listen and that's what faith means. It has nothing to do with your belief or unbelief about some external reality. It has to do with your decision to place your trust in this teaching or not to place your trust. And it's clear that everyone has a problem with this teaching because in our own society, on the one hand, the corruption of our society comes from the Muslims and the immigrants who are coming into our country. From the other side, the problem is the uneducated, poor white people of our country. Either way, there's an outside force that is corrupting our society. Human beings are in the same boat as the disciples, which is they can't stop believing this incorrect teaching that what comes from outside defiles us. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. And this is a classic list, Richard, once again, from the law that the Torah is given to save us from, to protect our steps so that we would not fall into these things. And it's not by coincidence that the penultimate of this list is pride and foolishness, because pride and foolishness precludes trust in God's instruction and leads you to destruction through all of these various forms of transgression. The beginning of the list is very similar to the accusations of Hosea 4, 1 and 2 against the people. And the reason in Hosea that they're performing these actions is because they're lacking mercy, truth, and knowledge of God. When one reads this through the lens of Hosea, we see that there is a basic ignorance of the disciples if you don't understand the things from inside, if this is too general for you, let me give you a list of 10 things. Be careful of these things, and then maybe you can begin to understand. I mean, Jesus can't be any clearer about this. And we can tell that this is a difficult teaching in spite of its clarity because we see that these are precisely the problems that we experience today that every generation has been experiencing. It's like my dad used to say to us as kids. He said it all the time. Don't be fooled. The teaching of the Bible is very simple. People make a big deal out of it because they don't want to follow it. But in reality, faith is very simple. You either do it or you reject it. This is the teaching I was weaned on and this teaching saved me. This teaching led me down a path in life where I found myself in the arms of scripture and I'm thankful for this teaching. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. They start on the inside. Don't look to anyone else. Don't seek to blame. Don't look for a source of corruption. Don't try to figure out who's right and who's wrong so that you can claim you're right. Just begin and end where Jesus begins and ends with this very straightforward teaching that you are the problem. Do not follow your heart. Thanks very much, Dr. Hunter. Thank you, Father. Just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.